Hey guys, what's up? Mad Season here, back with another video for you. It's about time for another episode in my Patch by Patch series, where I go over each patch in the game's history, one by one, and to give you a glimpse of how the game has changed over the years. There's quite a lot going on in the last episode. We talked a bit more about the old skill and talent systems, we took a peek at the talent trees for the Priest and Rogue, and we saw the arrival of the ninth and final class, the Hunter. We also saw Boats and Zeppelins make their debut, and much more. It's kind of a hard patch to top content-wise. In this video, however, we're entering patch .10, which released in September of 2004. This one saw quite a few major systems being added or changed as well. Particularly in the late game, we have a plethora of updates. First, we have the level cap being raised to 60. Finally, after months and months of testing, we've reached the cap for Vanilla World of Warcraft. 60 doesn't sound like a lot, especially if you play the current game, but it was quite a task back then. It took the average player months to reach it, which a lot of people might say is a bad thing. Who would want to grind for two months to even start the endgame? But it's just another one of the things that made Classic special. It was an adventure, and you really saw your character grow in power inch by inch, and it gave you such a strong sense of character progression, which I think is actually harder to get nowadays. With how fast it is to level, and even the ability to straight up buy level boosts, the game today is more about that instant gratification, which is fine. Current and Classic are two different games, but it's not without its downsides. The journey to 60 is really something that I'm looking forward to with Retail Classic, and I'm really curious to see how players will react to it. Anyways, I'm getting way off track here. With level 60 now attainable, the next step is that endgame, and appropriately, point 10 saw some big updates in that realm. First up, we have the raid group system. Raid group functionality is now available. They'll be able to fight together in instance dungeons, and work together to accomplish tasks too difficult for 5-member groups. Something really interesting to note here is that at this point, dungeons weren't capped to 5 players. This would only change in patch 1.3, which was the Dire Mall patch, where Blizzard finally added caps to all of the dungeons in the game, and even still, most of them were set to 10, so still technically rateable. The exception would be Dire Mall, which was 5 players max, so this was the first really hard dungeon, because you couldn't simply zerk through it like all of the others. But until then, there wasn't anything stopping you from running the dead mines with a 40-man raid of level 20s, as evidenced by these old beta screenshots. Here we see a dwarf role-playing guild of 10 adventuring through the dungeon and trading loot. The only downsides would be that you'd receive less XP than you normally would since you got that penalty in raid groups, although at this point you could still do any quest in raid which was pretty broken. And obviously splitting like 5 drops between 40 people would be kind of tough. They were still balanced around 5 players for the most part, so ideally you'd stick to that to maximize your XP and loot, but it's interesting that there was an option of just zerging the hell out of everything if you were having difficulty. Speaking of instances though, we have two more added in this patch, and that's the Blackrock Spire and Stratholm. It's hard to overstate just how monumental both of these instances were in the game. If you ask any vanilla player what their favorite dungeons or raids were in the game, Stratholm or the Blackrock Spire is going to be a popular answer. It's hard to do them justice really, but I'll try anyways. First, we have the befouled city of Stratholm, now home of the Scourge and other various evildoers. The dungeon was unofficially split up into two sides. You have Human, which you go to by taking a left from the main entrance, and this would be filled with the corrupted Scarlet Crusade, led by the Dreadlord Balnazar, posing as their leader, Sidon Dathrohan. If you instead took a right, however, you would enter the Undead side, where you had to fight through a small army of Scourge, and ultimately take on the horsemen, Baron Rivendare. There is a locked back entrance, secret bosses abound, keys to collect, and a huge amount of lore tied to it, with players first laying eyes upon it in Warcraft 3 actually. It was the ultimate dungeon crawling experience tuned for that early endgame, and probably my personal favorite. Just like all the other dungeons, you could bring in 10 players all the way until patch 1.10, although as I remember, that was quite rare. Usually, if you knew what you were doing, 5 was more than enough, and honestly, I think a lot of people just didn't know that you could bring 10. Well, at least I didn't. 
Now this isn't patch point 10, but it's kind of interesting so I thought I'd show you anyways. But prior to this patch, there did exist another version of Stratholm with a wildly different layout. Heading left from the entrance just leads to a dead end, and heading to the right, where you'd normally find the chapel and the service entrance, we instead have that scarlet bastion and a wall where the back door would eventually be. So this would actually be the human portion of the dungeon. Heading inside, you can see it's super early as there aren't even any textures, and the building is much smaller in general. In the foyer here, we have some stairs leading up, and if you keep going, you go into that generic war planning room that you've seen a few different buildings. So this is probably where you'd fight a boss or something. Heading past the Bastion though, the rest of the dungeon is loosely the same as what we got on live servers. You have the ziggurats that you had to clear out one by one, and at the end we have Rivendare's courtyard. As you can see, his building is still being finished. And through that mysterious side tunnel that was eventually going to be Nexramus, we have, well, Nexramus. Of course, this never saw the light of day on live servers, and this is the only part of Stratholm from this particular build that would remain unchanged for all of vanilla. And as for the Blackrock Spire, again, another remarkable instance. This would be a player's first taste of an actual raid containing more than 5 players, as it was actually balanced for 15 people, at least until patch 1.10 where it was lowered to 10. Again, due to its enormous size, it was unofficially split up into two parts. We had the upper and lower Blackrock Spire. Prior to 1.10, you could do either of them with 15, but lower was a bit easier and people usually ran it with just 10 as I remember. The trick with this place was that to even enter the upper portion, you had to complete a short quest chain to get a ring that opens the door leading to it. To sum it up, you had to get 3 gems from a few bosses down here, and then you put it into an unadorned ring, and then travel across the world, and mind control a black drake, and use its fire on the unfinished ring to turn it into the seal of ascension, and this would act as a key to that door. This was quite tough at the time, because the gems didn't always drop, and you had to compete against your allies for them, so getting all three took a lot of dedication and luck. I still have mine today in fact, mostly for the nostalgia, but also because it was kind of a chore to get, and people would pay me to just zone in and unlock the door for them. It was actually quite a good money maker back then. Once you got it though, you gained access to the much tougher upper portion, which had iconic fights such as Rend Blackhand, The Beast, and General Dracosath. Again, lots of secrets and tons of quests to complete here, and it was usually the trial run for players to get ready for the primetime raids like the Molten Core and Anixia. The latter, of course, actually having quite an extensive quest chain to get attuned for, the finale of which was in the upper Blackrock Spire. So, just by these instances themselves, Point 10 is already quite an iconic patch, I think. And with new dungeons and raids come new zones. Three more in this one, and that's Winter Spring and the Western and Eastern Plaguelands. Appropriately, these would be the final three zones added to the game. Not really a whole lot to say about these, other than that we get to look at that cool overhead map style. The tunnel from Winter Spring to High Gel has yet to be blocked off, but I already talked about that in the previous video. Something I thought was funny though, is that Everlook has a much more icy look to it. As you can see, they take a liking to living in igloos. As for the Western Plague Lands, this is all largely the same as you'd expect, with the exception of the Isle of Cardero. Now, this is also footage just prior to this patch, but I thought I'd show you anyways. Here you can see that the island is still being worked on by the Blizzard Construction Company, so watch your step. It's definitely much smaller than the release version, with way less buildings, and the main one itself is quite a bit different. To the right of it is an actual crypt, which is a clue to the original design of Skolomance. Initially, they wanted it to be an outdoor area where you just did some quests and whatnot, and it was actually set to be under Uther's tomb southwest a bit, but they ended up making it so large that they thought, hey, why don't we just make this into a dungeon? Well, it was a good call because I thought it ended up being one of the better dungeons in vanilla. This is where everyone got their tier 0 headpieces, so it was pretty important at the time. The town of Anderhal also has a wildly different layout, and it would remain this way all the way until patch 1.4, 
where it was redesigned to improve the overall navigability. This was a pretty important area, holding the Lich, Arach the Summoner, whom you needed to kill to get your Skolomance key. And it of course holds Chromie, who had some important quests tied to her as well. And lastly, for the Eastern Plague Lands, this is all largely the same. That earlier version would be missing that service entrance, of course, since it didn't exist in the dungeon. But for point 10, I can't find any obvious differences. You have the Light's Hope Chapel, Tyrion's Hovel, Tyr's Hand, all of the important areas of the zone. The latter, I think, a lot of us spent quite a while at since it was one of the better farming spots, holding a plethora of elite Scarlet Crusade enemies. I remember that this was the prime spot for all of the gold sellers back then. Lots of rogues and hunters who would speak broken English and would always gank chess from you when you were fighting. In point 9, we saw how transportation saw a big update with boats and zeppelins. In this patch, we finally saw the Deep Run Tram being added to the game. That is, the one we all know and love, which goes between Stormwind and Ironforge. Before this, in Stormwind, there was just this suspicious looking wall where the entrance normally was. So, with Old Ironforge now gone, and Nomergon now a dungeon, they finally made use out of the tram system, and it was a godsend. The Griffins were nice, but since money was so hard to come by, people often opted for the tram method to save just a little bit of extra money. And without it, we never would have had that infamous Enotep and Artemisa erotic role-playing fiasco, so it was totally worth it for that alone. Speaking of traveling though, there were some new flight paths being added as well to make the globe trotting a bit easier. I don't have anything specific to say about these ones, but I did want to point out that griffins, although useful, weren't an ultimate solution to traveling. Back then, they were kind of limited because they were much more sparse in general, and not only that, but they were also slower. Griffins and Windriders have been sped up massively over the years, but in vanilla, you'd have flight paths that could go on for quite a while. Don't quote me on this, but I think the longest one was from Darkshore to Silithus or something like that, and it took somewhere around 20 minutes, I want to say. So, that's when you'd restock on beer. Moving on to the gameplay systems here though, we have trade skills now becoming professions. If you remember, trade skills were the last surviving remnants of that old skill point system. This finally saw its death in this patch, with trade skills being moved to what they termed professions. You could now only train two max, paid with gold instead of skill points, and with that changed, there is officially no more need for the skill point system in general. As they stated, they made this change to make things more simple, balanced, and more intuitive, but also to create a more vibrant market for trade goods as they described it. And that makes sense to me. If you could get every profession, it would remove a lot of that player interaction, which was so crucial for the community building aspect back then. Some collateral damage though, was the removal of the survival skill system, which I talked about in the past, so I won't go into that too much. Basically, it was a profession for building torches to light your way, and other things to make adventuring easier. I think a lesser known long lost profession though, is gemology. Well, at least temporarily, because this would later be reincarnated as Jewel Crafting, which saw its release during the Burning Crusade expansion, of course. Kind of interesting to think how vanilla World of Warcraft would have been with gemology, assuming that it was similar to Jewel Crafting. Would we have been cutting Arcanite Crystals into Intellect Gems, or Azerothian Diamonds into Stamina Gems? Anyways, back to skill points. These are now gone, and the game is much closer to what most people remember of Vanilla World of Warcraft. Not entirely though, since they were still phasing out the old talent system. In this patch, the Druid and Shamans saw their talent trees added. Again, quite a different layout than what you're used to I'm sure. As for the Druid, some highlights would be the fact that they initially had the Shaman's Reincarnation spell, which is pretty interesting I thought. It was the 31 point talent for the Restoration Tree as you can see. As for the Feral Tree, this is still pretty awkward with talents aimed both towards DPS and tanking. And for the Grand Finale 31 point talent, we have a uh, reduced mana cost of shapeshifting. Before we go crazy with that though, this is topped only by the Restoration Shaman, whose 31 point talent is that Troll Regeneration Racial. Troll Shamans would basically have been raid bosses, 
So for the sake of fair play, it was eventually changed. So those are all of the major features. Like I said, it was quite a big patch. There are some little things though that I'd like to mention here. First we have the character creation screen finally seeing an update. This is the old version. It's a bit too heavy on menus, and this is the point .10 version. Much closer to what we all recognize, and much cleaner. And another change is the removal of dwarf mages. Well actually, you couldn't just make any new ones from this point forward. If you had a dwarf mage, you got to keep it, which made them sort of a rare commodity back then. They did this because the Alliance had more freedom with race and class combinations compared to the Horde, so they just trimmed it down a bit to make it more even. Anyways, next up we have food and drink effectiveness is increased. Now this is pretty funny because it was already excruciatingly slow in vanilla. You mean to tell me that it was slower? Maybe it was super realistic. Like to regenerate health and mana, it took you as long as a normal meal in real life. How quickly can you down an entire homemade pie? It's pretty ridiculous if you think about it. Our character should be 400 pounds and constantly need bathroom breaks. Here we also have the Stranglethorn Arena becoming functional, with everyone now getting flagged when they entered it. This place was also pretty important, not just for the PvP, but it was also used quite a bit in the old gameplay trailers to hype people up, although the enemies they fought were highly inappropriate for the zone. Worgens, those stone keepers, a treant? Talk about false advertising. I always thought that having an arena in this zone was so appropriate. It was one of the most densely populated areas where the Horde and Alliance first met up, and if you were here on a PvP server, it was a bloodbath. Anything you did took twice as long because you were just constantly looking over your shoulder, making sure you only pull one enemy at a time, or healing back up to full between pulls because you just knew that there was some rogue watching and waiting to ruin your day. Here's a bit of advice for those planning on playing on a PvP server in Classic. Bring friends, you'll need them. And another low-key big change is the birth of item sets. Although there were very few at this point, they ended up being so important to the game. One of the carrots on the stick was always getting that next item set and to get those cool set bonuses. And even just for the looks. Aw oh man, look how cool that guy looks. The Shadowcraft set was the reason I made a rogue back then because I just thought it was so cool when I first saw it. And then of course we eventually got higher tiers from the bigger raids which I'm sure was one of the primary motivators for people to even raid back then. They provided an added flair to your character, a bit more depth, class fantasy, and I think people underestimate just how important they were. It's hard to imagine the game without them, unless you play BFA where they took them out, but I just ranted about that in my review, so I'm not even going to get into that hornet's nest. But that's about it. This would pretty much be the last major patch of the beta. Point 11 and 12 had just a few minor changes here and there, and after that it's the release patch 1.1. As always, I hope you found the video interesting or entertaining. Like it if you liked it, and I'll see you in the next one. Peace. Farewell for now, mortals. We hope you enjoyed today's video. See you again soon.